everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us, as always, is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Headquarters here in Burbank, California. You missed, it's already been a great day. We were breakdancing on the floor earlier. <laughs> Lots of things going on. Ashley's having a good time. Ray's here. Fiesta. Ole. Also here, John Schnapp. <laughs> Best suplex ever. <laughs> Worst <laughs> suplex ever. <laughs> also here is Christian Arloff. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's oh, just do a silly, stupid dance. How you like that? One of those days already. Yeah. All right, let's get started. All right. Even before Disney acquired Lucasfilm, many have speculated if there was going to be an Indiana Jones 5 or not. Those who believe we will get an Indy 5 movie with Harrison Ford once again donning the brown fedora hat have just been given a giant justification for their belief. In a recent interview with Yahoo Movie, Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks were doing a Q&A for their new film Bridge of Spies when Spielberg said the following. We've got to figure this out because now Tom is tied with Harrison Ford. Harrison and I did four movies. Tom and I have done four movies. Now I'll probably do an Indy 5 with Harrison It'll be five for Harrison, four for Tom. Then I've got to make another one with Tom, so that will be five for Tom, five for Harrison. And I think I'm going to leapfrog that way for the rest of my career with Dale Day-Lewis and everything else. (laughs) John, do these comments sway your belief that an Indiana Jones 5 will actually happen? First of all, you know you are, and forgive my language for a second, you know you are the shit in Hollywood. We can talk about... Hey, I'll do all these with Harris Ford, and then I'll do all these Tom Hanks, and I'll have Daniel Day Lewis and everything. That's when you know you are the man. <laughs> is when you're Steven Spielberg and you say stuff like this. Look, I've been saying for a while I'm very dubious of another Indiana Jones film happening, especially with Harrison Ford. Um, just at at his age to pull it off. Now I, I love Harrison Ford. I think he's great. I'll see anything that he's in. Um, but you know, I don't want. I've said before. An Indiana Jones movie set in the early 70s. I don't want, you know, I like the Nazi era Indiana Jones stories. Plus, I, you know, I just never thought it would happen. That being said, I didn't just read these comments from Spielberg. I found the video footage and I went and watched him saying this. And it sounded very matter of fact to me. Like we were wondering, you know, in our pre-production meeting, he's like, do you think maybe, you know, Spielberg said that kind of sarcastic that I'll probably have to do another Indiana Jones with Harrison Ford? No, it sounded very matter of fact. And I got to say, if I thought before that there was maybe a 20% chance of, you know, Harrison Ford and Steven Spielberg doing another Indiana Jones film, I got to tell you, this one comment from Spielberg has shifted me maybe like all the way to 65% now that I think. So it, for me, it's moved my opinion on this massively. So let's see how this turns out. Christian, you read the comments. Has it swayed your thoughts on this? Um, Not necessarily swayed because I still think uh, my, my perfect idea for an Indiana Jones 5 movie is to have Han, Han Solo, is to have Harrison <laughs> Ford is to have Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones but in flashback scenes introduce whoever the new actor is going to be whether it's Chris Pratt or whoever it's going to be because then you will you'll associate the actor in flashback form to when they finally do a new Indiana Jones it's not foreign to us it's like oh they did that with the blessing the only reason why I think I actually think it's 95% is why I think it's going to happen because I think, as much as Steven Spielberg, George Lucas is one of his best friends and has nothing but the utmost respect for him. I think that Spielberg wants to do a movie without George Lucas, uh, an Indiana Jones movie. I think that Indiana Jones, they, there was a Frank Darabont s- script going around for for the fourth one, and that was scrapped because Lucas didn't like it. I think that Lucas had such a hold on and it for Spielberg so long. Spielberg and Ford did like it very much so, and I think that because, and I think that that was one of the, the rumors was. The reason that Harrison Ford signed on to Force Awakens is because he wanted to do another Indiana Jones movie. I think they all know that they weren't happy with the fourth one. So I think this is going to happen. I wouldn't be surprised if if we get an announcement in the next year or so. Schnapp. Yeah, that picture of them is definitely not them watching the Crystal Skull. <laughs> no. Because, like, because, yeah. yeah, they're, they're watching not, Raiders. Yeah, they're watching. Hey, remember the old thing? So I completely agree with you. I think it, it would work great with him bookending it. In fact, they did that in the television show. If you go on YouTube, you could see it never aired, but they shot Harrison Ford in this sequence. That's right. That bookends the young Indiana Jones. Oh, they did it with River Phoenix, too. Yeah, but I'm just saying they actually did. Yeah, they did it already. So it does work. 
And uh, I, they just have to get make sure they give them that little scar, you know, whoever the actor is going to be. I think it'd be a great idea. I'd love to see an Indy 5, if anything, just to wash away the horrible taste of the Indiana Jones and the Crystal Skull or a spider or whatever it was called. Like, I don't even, it doesn't even count. Spider. There's only three of them. I don't, that fourth one is just a weird aberration. So I'd love to see a fifth one that can launch a new series. Here's the thing with me with uh, Crystal Skull. I walked out, I remember walking out of that and I, I remember thinking this movie is not worthy of the Indiana Jones right. name. But I'll say this. I, I watched it a couple of times. I remember thinking, you know what? If this movie was called Adventure Bob and the Trek for the Alien Artifact, and it wasn't Indiana Jones, and it was just some character named Adventure Bob, I, I might have walked out of that movie going, hey, not a bad little, right. little, little adventure film, but it's not, it wasn't worthy of the Indiana Jones name, nope. uh, you know, at all. Here's the one thing. Let me ask you guys if you think this will be a problem. Because I had the same thought about this with Han Solo. With the young Indiana Jones stuff, or in Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade, when they went back to River Phoenix, we were looking at Indiana Jones in those flashbacks at a younger Indiana Jones than we had ever seen before. What we're talking about now, the possibility of Harrison Ford being in his present day, and then flashing back to say Chris Pratt as younger Indiana Jones. Now we're flashing back to scenes of Indiana Jones at an age we have seen before. Right. And that doesn't look like Harrison Ford anymore. Do you think that could be an issue or do you think it really won't be a problem at all? I mean, it's of course it's it's a concern because but you have to do it. Because if you want mm -hmm. if you want to further the franchise, if that's what you want to if you want to do, then right. if you're gonna put someone at that age, because it's the Disney's all about franchise, the movie business is about franchise. You wanna hope that you can get, let's say it's Chris Pratt three, four movies out of him as Indiana Jones. So it's absolutely a concern because, well, that's not the Harrison Ford. That's not Harrison Ford. But then if Chris Pratt knocks out of the park or if it's a Bradley Cooper or someone along those lines, whoever does it and convinces us that they can be the Indiana Jones that we know, no, why not? Schnapp, do you think it'll be a problem? Do you think it won't be an issue at all? I don't think it'll be an issue. I think, you know, with a little like, remember, they did that with uh, Looper. They did a little modification uh, to Gordon uh, Lew, uh, Levitt, Levitt, thank you. Nose, um, right. To do the nose and the if they did, even if they just added that little scar that Harrison Ford has, just anything like that, just that alone. I mean, remember, Ewan <clears throat> McGregor doesn't look anything like Alec Guinness, like nothing like Alec Guinness. Yet he did a good job. As like we're not seeing them side by side in the same movie, but technically that is the, supposed to be the same character. So I don't think it'll be that much of an issue. All right, what's next? While Mad Max Fury Road was garnering the praises of both fans and critics alike, some people complained that the film felt like Charlize Theron's Furiosa was the real star of the movie rather than Mad Max himself. And so when the topic of a possible sequel comes up, many wonder how big of a role Furiosa may play. While according to a recent interview with director George Miller, she won't play any role at all, at least for now. Miller said the following, she's not in the Mad Max sequel story, but in one of the stories, there's an inter interaction between between Max and Furiosa. I can't really say more than that because it's still in progress. Schnapp, considering her popularity in the first film, would it be a mistake to do a Mad Max sequel without Furiosa? Not at all. I think Mad Max is the uh, is the main character. I know a lot of people had issues that you know that he shared screen time almost equally. Some would say more, some would say less with the character Furiosa, who was great. Charlie's Throne deserves her own movie. So I think I know for a while that, you know, Miller had been developing not only this, but all these other ideas for 17 years to do a Mad Max sequel. Yeah. So he had all these other ideas and he was like, you know, I wasn't sure I had these other ideas. And then I just came up with two more right when we were doing post-production on, on Mad Max Fury Road. So he has one called Wasteland and he has one called Furiosa. One is all obviously about Charlie's Throne and the other one is all about Mad Max. Also, you've heard uh, they were on set arguing. There were a lot of fights and some skirmishes between Tom, Tom, Tom Hardy, Hardy and, and Charlie Theron. Theron yeah. So got to keep them separated. Basically, if you want to make a sequel, they're not going to be in it together. So it makes total sense. I would love to see a Mad Max Wasteland movie come next with Tom Hardy as Mad Max, maybe going to Gas City, maybe going completely somewhere else. A whole other tale. And that's what's great about the Mad Max other the older films with uh, Mel Gibson is they were individual films. It was like, yeah, sure, it's a trilogy. And now you have four four movies, but each one stands alone. It's he's in the beginning, he's a drifter, he drifts into somebody's world. You can watch world. the third film without having seen the other two totally. and still appreciate it. And it, it works perfectly. So I don't have any issue with that. And in fact, I would love to see him do both of those films. You know, I just wish he was doing Man of Steel too, but whatever. Yeah, um, I, I do agree with a lot of people who say this was Charlize Theron's 
movie. It mm-hmm. was Furiosa more than Mad Max film, absolutely. And she was great in it and awesome in it. That being said, that doesn't suddenly mean Tom Hardy ain't Mad Max. Right. You know, of course you can do another Mad Max film with our, without Charlize there. Absolutely, just because you put the spotlight on the one character doesn't diminish the other character, nor does it negate their ability to go off and do the next adventure. I think what we're going to get here is at the heart of it, once we have two or three of these Mad Max films, we're going to see that Mad Max himself is the spine of all of the movies, and he is the central character, even if in one chapter it seems like another character. So while I would love to see, because even though they weren't getting along on set, I thought the chemistry they had together, while not very verbal, I thought the on-screen chemistry was great. And I would love to see the two of them in more films together, but that does not necessitate having to have Furiosa in future Mad Max films. I think this can work just fine. What about you? Oh, absolutely. It can work just fine. I think that the point of the first movie, well, the fourth movie, was that (laughs) the the point of it was this was Furiosa's story. It it was. And Mad Max happens to fall upon this storyline, and we followed it. And guess who I trust? Miller. I trust him. If he yeah. says he's not going to put her in the next one, okay, that's not the story he wants to tell. Um, I, you guys know Tom Hardy's one of my favorites. I think that he's the perfect Mad Max. I also think that this was a really smart choice to not focus on him in this particular movie because now it gives us... Look, look, at, look at what Nolan did in Batman Begins. Could have put the Joker in in the first. In the first sure. Yeah. Didn't do it. Did it in the second one and became one of the best movies maybe of all time. Right. That can also be said about not developing Max's character all the way through. Everyone I talk to, everybody I ask, what are your top three movies of the year? Most people have Max in there, in the top three. There's a reason for that. It's for what Miller was able to do to bring us back into this world. He has a storyline and a through line of where he wants to go. So Furiosa, I mean, she maybe pop up, like you said, in a standalone movie or in some other, maybe just in a, in a cameo in another one of the films. That's, to me, that story's told. I want to know more about Mad Max and the other adventures he goes on, and the movies are called Mad Max. And uh, another thing is, the, the all of the Mad Max stories, he drifts into someone right. else's story, right? Helps them and sacrifices Thunderdome, himself, right. yeah, to help every one them. of those movies. Every yeah. single one of those movies, he ends up being the hurt one and alone and leaves. Just like your great westerns. Is this like a post apocalyptic yes, western? Yes, yep. absolutely. So I was going like, to say the exact same yeah, thing. Yeah, it's like that's, if people don't understand that, it's like that's something you got to watch a bunch of westerns. He's shit into it. He's Clint Eastwood. He's <laughs> well, no, like, it's, it's, it yeah. really is. It's like the Clint Eastwood thing who wanders into this dusty town yeah. and that they need a hero and yeah. he's now the yeah. guy on the spot, even yeah. though unlikely as it is. All right, folks, we've reached out part of the show now for buy or sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, Ashley's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down. And those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So, Ashley, what do we got? As many of you will remember, it was recently announced that UFC superstar Ronda Rousey would star in the upcoming remake of Roadhouse. At the time, no director was mentioned until now. According to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, The Notebook and Alpha Dog director Nick Cassavetes will take over the film. Christian buy or sell the Roadhouse remake now that Nick Cassavetes will be directing it. Well, it doesn't say Emily Blunt's replacing Ronda Rousey. Um, <laughs> no, but I, and it's funny, though. I still buy it, and I bought it when it was a story without her in it because, and I know, people are yelling at me, how dare you want to see Roadhouse remake with, a, with someone who can't act? For her, for her, this is, it, like, she... She could do, not that it's going to be the most convincing thing. I'm with you. I understand. She's not a good actress at all. But if you're going to put her in movies, it makes sense to to capitalize on her right now. She's huge. She's one of the biggest athletes out there. I mean, remember, Shaq had a movie back in the day with Kazam. Okay? Now, this is certainly going to be better than Kazam. And when you put (laughs) Cassavetes in there, who I think is a really good director and hasn't had... His biggest hit really is The Notebook, which is strange. Which is so weird when, to think. Especially right. when you think of him. Like, right. if you remember, he was in Face Off, and he was like this, he's like tatted up, like like a tough dude. Right. So I actually think that he is the perfect director for this remake. Um, and maybe he could, just don't ever say anything. See, here's, a, I, I saw this, because unless, until they announced that they're replacing uh, Ronda Rousey with somebody else, I, I've got to sell this. Look, everybody knows I am a, fanatical Ronda Rousey fan. I mean, I love Ronda Rousey. She is amazing. (laughs) Pardon me, but my girl can't act, like, at all. That's not to say that at some, she won't develop and get better and become a leading actress at some point in her life. I'm not saying that can't happen. Highly unlikely. But (laughs) all I'm saying is, when you look at what she's doing right now, she's 
terrible. She's while I didn't mind her in Entourage, she it, there's no denying she even struggles playing herself. And if this was something like Kickboxer, right, where hey look, Jean Claude Van Damme did not exactly bring Academy Award level acting chops to the role in the first place. Patrick Swayze, I almost said Patrick Stewart. Patrick Swayze brought real acting chops to yeah. that role in the first one. And so, look, I totally believe in her becoming an actress. I totally believe in her that someday she can lead a film. But she ain't there yet. She is just plain awful right now, and she'll kill me for saying it. But, I mean, it's true. As big of a fan as I am of her, and I believe she can get there someday. But today ain't the day. It doesn't matter if you put Spielberg behind this lens. It's not going to work. And so, for me, right now, I still got to sell it. I'm going to buy it, <laughs> and I'm buying it because they picked Nick Cassavetes. Not only is he a good it's director, a good choice. Yeah. but he's also a good writer-director. In fact, he's written and directed all of the movies. Alpha Dog, which is a great film, and that's a violent film. But most of his films, like he's really well known for that, and he's really well known for writing Blow, but all of his other films are female-centric. And he wrote them. And yeah. they're all about emotional, dealing with emotions, and, and they're all female-centric. And his mom is Gina Rollins. You know, not only his dad, you know, super famous Cassavetes, but that's his mom, one of the great actress, and that was his very first movie directing his mom in a female-centric role. So and that he writes and directs. So he is perfect to take Ronda Rousey and shape her and help guide her to become an actress in this film. And I think it's going to be a really great remake. And I think you're you guys are going to feel like you're going to eat your words. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I think Ronda Rousey is actually going to be really good in this film. This is the point. If this was a scripted show, where then those little like lines are going to say. Yeah. 18 months later, know, as I, me and Schnepp walking out of theater, <laughs> Shep's like, what was I thinking? I know. Like, or, <laughs> or, or me. Or, or like, or where me. are the words? How do I eat them? How do I, like, eat them? The, I yeah. will say this about the writing of Cassavetes as well, too, because we, you joke about the notebook, I, but I don't think anybody would argue that it's the best Nicholas Sparks adaptation ever. There's no argue. Look, it's because, a very female-centric film, but it is a great movie. It no, really no, no, is. yeah, and that's because and that's because he wrote that. Yeah, he wrote it, and Ryan Gosling had a lot to do with that as well, too. And you, that is clearly the best Nicholas Sparks movies that aren't getting any better than that. Um, so I, look, I'm rooting for her. I just me too. Just, some people me just too. don't have it, and I no, just but don't know if she's if you're got a writer director and like from the kind of content that he's written and directed. That's when I, I went back and looked at all of his films because I knew that Ronda Rousey, yeah, she's not been in anything yet to prove that she can act. Yeah, she is. Like ferocious, she in has the, actually proven the opposite. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, I agree, but I'm just saying everybody who gets into that ring of acting eventually will either become good or fail and not be. A, you know, so she, this is her big chance. So. You know, what? and and to to go against my own point, let's look like uh, what was the one with Gina Carano and Ewan McGregor? Haywire. Okay, but, but Haywire. Okay, in the hands of a good director, you know, Gina Carano is not. <laughs> She's certainly a better actress right now than Ronda Rousey is, but she's certainly not what you would call a great actress. But in the hands of the right director, who knows how to use her and when not to use her, what aspects of her to use and what aspects not to use, it can become passable. And I think Gina Carano was passable in Haywire. Yeah, but the problem is that a lot of people don't realize this too. Is like you look like that, and they said some of her voice was dubbed in the movie. No, all of it was. All of it was dubbed. And right. I don't care about the comments. They're going, no, so, no, all of it was. I know for a fact, yeah. all of it was dubbed. It was the sex lies and videotape. Yeah, out. and it was yeah. all dubbed because she. there were ways to get around it. And Gina Carano has gotten better. I mean, in fact, they've, they've limited her roles in a she lot of stuff, too. She certainly has gotten better. She's yes. gotten Over better. The years. But I also think, but even when she delivers lines in Fast and Furious, I think that she looks like Leonardo DiCaprio compared to, to, to Ronda Rousey. The way, even in Entourage, because there's just that thing. And, I, and going into a fighting analogy, if you had Freddie Roach, okay, mm -hmm. who was one of the best trainers of all time, tried to teach me to fight Floyd Mayweather tomorrow, I'd, st I'd still get my face kicked out. I don't care how I great don't know. a trainer he is. I don't know. I was one punch. I'd be dead. But look at it this way. Fast and the Furious, she was playing a bodyguard, and her, her lines were like, all right, now I'm going to kick your ass, or something like that. Well, I, remember I was too. getting bored of this party anyway. Yes. Exactly. But I'm just saying, like, how much time do they really prep her? True. And she showed up, and they're like... And you don't necessarily have to act in those movies. Yeah, so right? I don't count any of that stuff. This is going to be like, this is, this, you know, die or, 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 or pass. It's one of those things with yeah. this movie. It's going to be either she's amazing in it or it's going to be horrible. No, she's she's going to sink like a rock in the lake. However, I, I, I think Cassavetes is going to help her. I, but I so. think I think I think Cassavetes will help. But I think we will all agree. We're all cheering for her, though. Yes. I, I would love for her to actually surprise us all. I think it would be great if she did. But I just don't think it's going to happen. All right. What's next? 
For several years now, 20th Century Fox has been trying to develop an Escape from New York remake with very little movement. However, according to a story in The Hollywood Reporter, that project has taken a major step forward as television's Luther creator Neil Cross has signed on to write the screenplay. Set in a dystopian future in the year 1997, the 1981 original starred Kerr Russell as Snake Plissken, an eye-patch convict sent into a maximum security prison, formerly the island of Manhattan, to rescue the president. John Byers sell an Escape from New York remake with Neil Cross writing it. Well, I I buy it. I think this is one of those movies that is ripe for a remake. I just look bonus points to you filmmakers too if you still make it set in 1997. Um, I know seriously. I I think this is a movie that is ripe for this. I think it could be fantastic. This is a great guy to bring on board. It's a great start. My but my enthusiasm is tempered a bit because for seven years. They have been trying to get this thing going, and there have been little announcements here and there. Oh, okay, now we're doing this, and then nothing comes of it. Now we brought this guy on to help develop it, and then nothing happens. So while I am very excited for this, I think this is great, and I buy it, and the whole bit, my enthusiasm is tempered because I'm just kind of at the point now of I'll believe it when I see it. Maybe once they bring a, a, like a real <coughs> director on and they start casting, because remember Gerard Butler yeah. was supposed to be in the, in the role at 1.2, yeah. and then that died, that was years ago. So we'll see, but just on face value for now, I'm going to buy it. I definitely buy it, and I couldn't agree with you more. I think this is one of those movies that absolutely should have a remake because when Carpenter made it, originally it didn't have a big budget at all yeah. to do this thing. I, this is one of those movies that I think would really benefit from a big budget because you could do, and I don't want to have him direct it, but I think when you look at a Roland Emmerich type movie in those big um, – Summer Big set pieces. Set yeah. pieces. That's the type of movie this should be, and it could be a lot of fun to watch. But I'm actually encouraged that it's taken so long because they're not just rushing it on on, on the name brand. They're not they're not just rushing it to say, oh, this could be a cool premise, and not just doing it just because it's a summer blockbuster movie. They want to find the right take for it. They want to find the right star that's going to be able to do Snake Plissken. Like mm -hmm. to me, that's encouraging. And bringing on this dude, I haven't seen Luther, but I can't tell you out of all the shows that I've ever been asked to review or anything luther has been up there everyone loves yeah. whoever's watched luther luther has been that one that people really get behind so th to me it's a buy yes can, can we all at least agree though that w regardless of who directs us whatever they've got to get kurt russell as the president ah, that would i would amazing. love right. it if they got kurt russell as president anyway it's be amazing thoughts. idris elba aside from stringer <laughs> bell bam him as luther, luther i yeah. loved luther I, especially the very first season Second season kind of falls off a little I didn't for see myself. The one. But yeah, first season, incredible. Incredible, incredible. Neil Cross, that they got this guy who writes really, really well, does really good characterization. I think my personal feeling is I'd like to see it set in 2050. I don't need, like when Carpenter wrote it, it wasn't, the, it was the future. He wrote it, it was like 1997, right. that's 17 years from now, or maybe 20 years from now when he actually wrote or came up with the idea. And now it's just, it would be corny and it would just, I don't want to see a corny jokey, like the year is 1997, like a retro future. Oh thing. no, they won't It would just no. corn it up. So we're like some alternate dimension stuff. Forget it, make it 2050. Have it like have that cool premise that Carpenter originally thought of, like yeah, New York is the climate change, all these different things that we live in now, and amplify that. You just if science fiction is amplifying what we live in now mm -hmm. and taking that, and making it either this or that. So I think with that premise, it's a perfect, cool remake, reboot, whatever you want to call it. So I'm excited they're finally getting it. They can lock down a good writer. I, I wouldn't even have them go that far in the future. I'd do the same thing that Carpenter did before, which he just went ahead like 16 years, right? Yeah. So I would say like maybe 2030. So it still feels sure, a little bit sure. like our world without being too futuristic. Right yeah. That could be really cool. All right, folks, listen, it's Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what's opening this week. Several films are opening in wide release over at our friends at AMC Theaters this week. We're going to talk about a couple of them today and then a couple more of them on Thursday. But Ashley, which films are we highlighting today? First up is the new Steven Spielberg film, Bridge of Spies. During the Cold War, the Soviet Union captures U.S. pilot Francis Gary Powers after shooting down his U-2 spy plane. Sentenced to 10 years in prison, Powers' only hope is New York lawyer James Donovan, played by Tom Hanks, <clears throat> recruited by a CIA operative to negotiate his release. Donovan boards a plane to Berlin, hoping to win the young man's freedom through a prisoner exchange. If all goes well, the Russians would get Rudolf Abe, the convicted spy who Donovan defended 
in court. Next up is Goosebumps. Upset about moving from the big city to a small town, young Zach Cooper finds a silver lining when he meets his beautiful neighbor, Hannah. The teen is surprised to learn that Hannah's mysterious father is R.L. Stein, played by Jack Black, the famous author of the best-selling Goosebumps series. When Zach accidentally unleashes the monsters from the Fantastic Tales, it's up to Stein, his daughter, and Cooper to return the beasts back to the books where they belong. Christian, which of these movies should audiences be looking forward to this weekend? It's funny, though, too, because I I had heard initially things about Goosebumps that it wasn't that good. And then I think it's like an 86 or 87 on percent. 82 as of this moment. 82%, 82% on, on Rotten Tomatoes. Tomatoes right I'm hearing really good things about it. I hear it's a really fun family movie. So like I actually really want to see that one because it always reminded me a little bit of like Jumanji. And so I, I'm curious to see how it plays out. I'm going to see it this weekend. But I saw Bridge of Spies. And I think I think it's a really good film. But it, it's, it's funny because I was just talking about this with someone else too. You're, you're watching this movie and it doesn't have that Spielberg magic to it. Like it clearly is a, it's a good film. And if you didn't know Spielberg did it, you'd be like, oh, okay, who's, who's this director? But like, you know, when you're watching a Spielberg film, you're just over, you're t- overtaken by the magic of filmmaking and, there, and there's glimpses of it. But I thought that the first half of it was a little bit more interesting to me than even when he goes off and he's trying to set up these deals. Um, I think it's a movie that you, if you find on the Netflix or cable, you'll you'll watch it. And be like, oh, that was really good. But strangely enough, I actually out of the two picking, I'd probably go see Goosebumps this weekend. Yeah, it's funny. I have been really looking forward to both of these films. I was supposed to see Goosebumps like two and a half months ago, and last second I couldn't go. But I've liked the trailers for them actually, even though I thought the idea was stupid when I first heard it. Saw the trailers, liked the trailers, and despite the fact that I heard from some other people in this room that it's really not all that good. I've, I've still been looking forward to it. Bridge of Spies is an absolute for me that I'm really dying to see. I was supposed to see it last night, but I've been a little bit under the weather, so I, still, I couldn't go. Steven Spielberg, Tom Hanks, magic, magic, magic. Uh, I cannot wait to see that. I'm hoping it's at least as good as what you're saying, maybe better. So the, both of them I'm actually really looking forward to seeing, so that's where I'm at. But Schnepp, you've seen one of these films. Yeah, I didn't see Bridge of Spies, and I'm looking forward to seeing it, but like, you know Spielberg. Every every single time you see a frame from one of his films, it's just so richly shot, and the cinematography is so amazing. It always feels like a real movie. Yeah. It doesn't even matter. Like There's that intimacy one to all of his yeah. films. Yeah. So I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the film. I did, it's not like this. Like I cannot wait to see Bridge of Spies, but I am looking forward to eventually seeing it. And I'd like to see it in the theater. I did see Goosebumps like two and a half months ago, and I was disappointed. I felt it was very uneven and didn't deliver a lot of the laughs that I thought it would. A couple other people were in the theater. Well, everybody who went with you came back saying they weren't happy with it. A few it. people that we talked to who, who did see it actually did like it. So we we're like, oh, that's weird. I wonder what they saw that we didn't. So I don't know if they made adjustments to the film since we saw it, but I, you know, I can't recommend it. But I know a lot of other people really liked it. So you're going to have to make that, you know, that choice yourself. Go check it out. And maybe you'll dig it. So. Let me ask you, Ashley, if you had a choice right now, I said, right now we can either go see Bridge of Spies or we can go see Goosebumps. Easy. Which theater is Ashley taking us to? Goosebumps for sure. Goosebumps is like my childhood. I was a little <laughs> bit too young, but I had an older brother and he had all these Goosebumps book in his clo- like book like the books in his um, closet. And I would take them to school and pretend that I was reading the Goosebumps books because like I was young and I thought it was really cool reading the Goosebumps <laughs> books. So it was just it just reminds me of my childhood and the fact that Jack Black is in it. When I saw the trailer, I didn't even really recognize him, but then I remember Jack Black is in it. I'm super excited for this and like perfect time of year for this to come out. It's kind of fun. The kids can go see it. Puts you in that like Halloween mood. So I'm really excited for Goosebumps. Okay, hold the phone. You have a brother? I have an older brother. What are you I, talking about? I talk about my brother all the time. I, I've never heard you. I, I, first, time, older first time I've ever heard about this. Bill, what up? Okay, you got. This fake I want your brother yours. on this show. My brother loves just to movies. talk. Really, I I'm want your so brother serious. on this show to, to talk here. about Ashley for like a half oh, hour. Oh gosh, yeah. I think Phil, awesome. Phil, get on here. <laughs> All right, folks, we reach that part of the show now for mailbag. Listen, if you've got a topic or a question you'd like us to address on the show, you can just email them in anytime to collidervideo at gmail.com. So, Ashley, what are you and your brother having in the mailbag today? <laughs> Well, Tristan L. writes, Hey, Collider crew, I have a question about Alfred Hitchcock's films, The Birds. It's my favorite Hitchcock film and heard some years ago that they were going to be a remake starring Naomi Watts. The last I heard, though, was Michael Bay's Platinum Dooms was going to produce it with Diedrich Van Rugen to direct the remake. Do you know if this is true and if there will be a remake? <laughs> Thanks and bring on the filthy. First of all, full kudos to you for writing in about Alfred Hitchcock. Um, Birds is not my favorite Hitchcock film, but it is certainly one of his masterpieces. I love The Birds. Mm-hmm. 
here's the thing. The last I heard on this, okay, this is going back to about January of this year. There was a port in Variety about this exact story, that Naomi Watts was still circling the film, that Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes was going to produce it. And there would be a time when, if I heard Michael Bay's Platinum Dunes was going to be producing, I would be like jumping overboard. But after watching Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that he produced and I really liked it, it's like, I'll give it a, I'll give it a go if he's producing something. I don't think I'd see a Michael Bay directed Birds remake, but you got Naomi Watts on boards, I'd be all for it. That being said, it's been dead silent ever since January. I haven't heard any new news about it since January. Um, it's still listed as being on the burner, but no movement has happened on it. So whether or not this project is still happening, I don't know. But I will say this. I would be interested. I'm not jumping up and down about it, but I would definitely be interested in this film if it were to come to pass. Have you heard anything about this, Christian? What do you think? I haven't heard anything since the initial report, but Escape from New York Yes. Roadhouse, <laughs> yes. Stay away from the birds. Sorry. Uh, especially, like, uh, even going off your point as far as Platinum Dunes did, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, that's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Yeah, very that's different films. Not yes, the birds. Absolutely. If someone was going to remake, <laughs> if Platinum Dunes was going to remake Jaws, no thanks. Uh, I don't want them touching the birds. The birds is, is a classic horror film and it's it's still it's to have an entire movie without a score it has no musical score because it doesn't need it it's terrifying all on its own they tried to do a remake with psycho didn't work and that gus van zandt did it right terrible stay away from hitchcock that's just a no-no well the van zandt one was like more of an experiment because it was a shot for it's shot still yeah. released it was in the kind theater. of like just remaking shot for shot exactly what hitchcock did yeah. so i can't say that was like a t it was a it was a weird experiment but yeah. uh my, my problem with the remake of the birds, I think, yeah, they should remake the birds, but get, I mean, Diedrich von Rijgen, I looked at his uh, IMDb because I'd never heard of him, and he's like, I just don't know what his Gosklink, Verdict, Drom Wimbels, like a whole bunch of films. Very that I've, prolific German directors. Yes, yes, a lot of German, Fubel, Spahn, Spulis, Scrimps. There's a lot of them. He's like, I don't know what they mean. I'm going to look no, into it. It means direct to Blu-ray. But right, the it Swan Swingle Scrink. Um, no, I, I, but I actually, it, it made me say, I'm going to actually check out two of these films. I'm going to look for whichever ones are available on one of the streaming services. And then if I have to rent it, I will. Because I want to see why did they pick this guy? to do the birds. There's got to be a reason. It just, they didn't just do the random, like, pick a German, but this guy's direct. Mm, mm, it tastes like birds. You know what I mean? It's like, he has to, there has to be a reason that he's doing it. So, to especially someone like, it's like, why Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds? What you can do with birds now, aside from birdemic, I'm not talking about stuff like that. I'm talking about, like, what you can do, like, imagine a scene with, like, a billion birds in the sky. It's like it's like Night of the Living Dead with birds. They I'm never gave about you a CGI reason. fest. <sighs> well, look at look at it like what they could actually do with like puppets and birds. It's like what they could do back then in the '60s. It's terrifying. Right. Do you, just, but do you trust Michael Bay's company to to not over CGI it and to use puppets? Because I, I don't. have no well, idea. I mean, we, it's hard I to mean, tell. Look, I mean, plan, the last Planet of the Apes movie was a CGI fest. But it was brilliant. Now, granted, that wasn't Michael Bay's Dune. I mean, but they shot real, yeah. You know, so I mean, it, it it really depends. But I think maybe this is totally culturally stereotyping, and I shouldn't do this. But there's something in me that feels pretty cool about um, a birds remake by an Artur German director. I don't know why. That's that what just I'm seems saying. To it's like, really it's a good. weird choice. I want to look into this guy's <laughs> filmography and see what he, because obviously they hired him for a reason. It's not just like, oh, that's that right. horror guy or this dude or an American director that we've heard of. It's someone we've never it, heard of. There's got to be a reason there. So, I mean, it could be cool. There could They could have an angle. So you know what scares me about that is that, remember Oliver Hirschbiegel who directed Downfall? It's another German mm, director. Right. Really good director. Downfall blew people away mm -hmm. they got brought him on to do invasion of the body snatchers oh right invasion. they had to take it away and <laughs> yeah. have the wachowskis redirect it was hard yeah all right what's next andrew mcconnell writes hey collider crew love the show my question is about writers for people who have an interest in movies it always seems to be the directors who get the majority of the credit for the making of the film do the writers deserve to get more recognition than they do while the director obviously has an important job at bringing the whole film together shouldn't the person who wrote the story also deserve credit too well, I mean, we are living in nature right now where writers are getting more attention. I mean, like, uh, Aaron Sorkin is a household name. Um, so, I mean, do they deserve more credit? Yes. I will say this, though, and I think, Shep, you'd back this up. Filmmaking really is a really big collaborative effort because, you know, from the writer to the director to the cinematographer to the editor to, like, there's a lot of credit that needs to be spread around. I And, and do writers deserve more credit than they get? Absolutely they do. 
I will still though say this, that the bottom line guy, the person who is most responsible is the man or woman sitting in that director's chair. Let me give you a little bit of an example. Tell me what you think about this. I, as a fun experiment, I wrote, I both wrote and directed and produced uh, my own my own film. Now, let's look at these two separate people. There was John the screenwriter, there was John the director. <clears throat> I actually, I'm pretty proud of the screenplay. I thought the screenplay was pretty good. It was okay. So, and then I also directed it and I came up with my movie. That being said, if we had somebody who was like a 15% better writer than me write the script, but I still directed it, the movie would have been a little bit better. But I also believe if we had somebody, if I had written the script, but had somebody who was a 15 to 20% better director than me, I think the difference in quality would have been much more significant in how much better the movie would have been if we had a better director than myself than if we had a better writer than myself. I just think, because you take my exact script, but get a better director than me, that movie turns out a lot better. If you get a better writer than me, but the same director, I think the movie turns out better, but marginally so. So do I believe writers deserve way more credit than they get? Yes, more than just Aaron Sorkin should be a household name. There should be a lot of guys and women out there who are household names that are great writers, but I still believe that most of the responsibility for how good or bad a movie turns out still rests with that person in the director's chair. Schnepp is both a writer and a director, played a lot of, and an editor and all that kind of stuff. How do you see this? I agree. I mean, but it's funny because television and, and movies are two different beasts. Oh, very different. So things, it's like yes. within the construct of a film, a two hour film, uh, why the directors seem to get more credit than the writers or even the producers or anybody on the rest of the whole team, because it is a team effort, you know, making the death of Superman lives. What happened was a, you know, like almost 13 month every single day, me, the editor, my, my gal, the producer, Holly Payne and myself sitting in that room, all of us throwing ideas cutting editing doing this so it was a, a definitely a super collaborative thing but like ultimately like you know here was my outline it changed it more from what i had written what it was going to be it turned into this other thing still had the beginning still had the middle still had the end but it was like it's a it's a thing especially with the documentary it changes and morphs when you have an actual script uh, the writers for television, which is also a giant group thing. You might see one person's name on written by, but it's like a whole bunch of people all chimed in on that one mm -hmm. script and they just give each other credit. Like you get to get, have credit for this one and kind of oversee it, but we'll all fix it and address it. So it, it plays in with the story arc. So that's why you have showrunners and you know, the main head writers, that's what they're making sure that it has a through line. So that's why the writers dominate television because they, I think it's like, it's a little back and forth. Like, writers don't get enough credit in film and directors don't get enough credit in television. television yeah, good so point. it's like, you know, it's like I know for myself as a director of television, you know, I, I sculpted and edited and composited and made like some of the best episodes of Metalocalypse, but it's like usually the writers get the credit for that. When, whereas I saw it from beginning to end all the way through, I, my name's still there, but it's like, it's one of those things like television is a totally different beast than, than a movie. But I agree is that both of them have that back and forth kind of thing that, like that that example is like uh, people who are directors of movies and the movie fails they'll never get a job again so it's like <laughs> oh they ruined it you know so the directors if they get they take all the credit for a successful film but they get all of the blame for a film that goes bad well that's what i was that's where i was going to go with it as well too because the director is the captain of the ship yeah so with all the moving parts the writers being part of the moving parts as well too but schnapp's example i mean look at josh trank what happened with fantastic yeah. four that script wasn't great no. You know, um, and, and you know he was part partially writing it as well too. But I think that you, the other thing that people need to realize, with I mean, Aaron Sorkin's an anomaly too. It's very rare that you have an Aaron Sor a person who writes the first draft of the script and then is the final writer by the end. Right. Um, working in the studio system for like three to four years, I one of my jobs in development was you get the first draft of, of a script that maybe someone it's written on spec or someone someone submits it and it's like okay this is an idea that we're going to buy or it might be an, an, an idea that the that let, let's say escape from new york that the studio has the rights and then they want to bring in some famous writers or some writers that are popular right now or that are good writers that, that there's just there's a hot list there's a list of, that of the, all the popular writers so let's say we want to we want to have a particular team that's come in and pitch we have the rights to escape from new york what's your take and they'll listen to three or four different writers they'll write the first draft and then maybe they hire on for two three different drafts 
they either like the drafts or don't like the drafts and they go in a different directions. There's people that are hired for rewrites. Right. A script, especially big budget, can go through many different writers. Yeah. Now, I all think they should get more credit for sure, but it's not always just like you see the names on the on the credits as a written by. It's not always a case that they're right. just written by that one or two people. All right, last question of the day. Emil Johansson writes, could the next Ant-Man movie be about Hank Pym instead of Paul Rudd's character? This is an excellent question because I remember the first time I watched Ant-Man, one of the things I said was, look, they opened the door where they wanted to go backwards and tell stories in the 60s and 70s of Hank Pym and his wife as the Wasp, but they could. Then when it, the name of the new movie was announced, Ant-Man and the Wasp, we all, myself, right. we just assumed, oh, so Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly, but wait a minute. What if they're talking about Hank Pym and his wife as Ant-Man and the Wasp, telling some of those espionage stories or the Cold War stories or whatever they, that is absolutely a possibility. Do I think that's what's happening? No, I think it's gonna be Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly. That's what I think is gonna happen. But I do believe there is enough there in front of us to say, you gotta at least consider. The fact that they made the announcement Ant-Man and the Wasp they didn't make the announcement, Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly return in Ant-Man and the Wasp. No, they just came out and said, mm -hmm. Ant-Man and the Wasp. You have to at least consider that possibility that maybe they're gonna tell one of those older stories. I would be fascinated by it. Now, I, I still think the smart play is to move forward with the story, do a Paul Rudd, Evangeline Lilly movie. That's what I do think they are doing. But I think your question is very valid. It is something that we have to keep in mind. Christian, what do you think? Or or the fact going back to our indiana jones conversation that in ant-man the first ant-man that we saw there was a lot of throwback to yeah. the ant-man and the wasp yeah. now we know that there is a new ant-man and the wasp why not both in the same movie <laughs> yeah. um oh absolutely very possible that could happen because they tease it how ha i loved her face eventually Liz's face when in the post credit when the, the the suit is revealed it was such spoiler yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean it's, the movie's it's been, been out long enough. So, so. Uh, but so I think to me, like the, to have her as the Wasp with Paul Rudd, you have to further that story. Oh yeah, I mean yeah, you have absolutely. to because he's part. Even in the Civil War trailer <laughs> that we saw at D twenty three, he's a part. He's a big part, and yeah. he, he's going to further into Phase three. But I would love to see what happened and the, even what happened to Hank's mind and the things that he went through right. leading up to the loss of his wife. But then another spoiler alert here to, for a second, what happens in the in next dimension? Is this gonna tie into Doctor Strange? Will she be found there? Will, will all these stories kind of tie in and weave in? Could be interesting. Yeah, I really wonder, like that's a, such an interesting point. Could they begin Ant-Man and the Wasp in the 60s on an operation with, you know, with Michael Douglas. That, that maybe ties into an operation now happening totally. in modern day. Or, or you start it out in the present, do the credit sequence, bam, then you're in the 60s and do a little quick, you know what I mean? The, the, the possibilities there, are really there and I'd love to see them use that. I mean, that's a great question. And now that the, that question has been presented, I hope that it happens. We'd yeah, all be disappointed yeah, if they don't do it, you know? <laughs> I think it'd be great. All right, folks, that'll do it for us for this installment of Clyde Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. Listen, don't forget, lots of great films playing over at our friends at AMC Theaters right now. Head on over to www.amctheaters.com for all of your theater, showtime, and of course, your movie ticket information. Hey, you like some TV shows? Well, <laughs> turns out tonight, The Flash is on. And what's the other one, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? is on tonight and don't forget we now have our recap shows that are on tonight so if you watch Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or The Flash make sure you come back to our YouTube channel tonight for our recap shows of those episodes I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me first of all sitting over here on my left Mr. John Schnepp Schnepp where can people find you online learning German uh, you can find me online in a couple hours on AMC's I'm sorry not AMC I keep saying AMC <laughs> AMC take, what happened we were just talking about this yeah. yesterday about when we still so, yeah, everyone just kept coming up to me I love AMC I mean Collider Hero so you'll find me on Collider Lighter Heroes, like in a couple hours, we're going to talk about a lot of all these New York Comic Con news, uh, sweaty events like Ant Man, you know, all these other announcements. And you can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp and at TDOSLWH. Get my film, The Death of Superman Lives, What Happened, at www.tdoslwh.com. And of course, sitting over here on my right, AMC Christian Harloff. Christian, where can people find you online? You'll find me on. Collider, Jedi <laughs> Council, uh, this Thursday. And look, we don't know. Is the trailer for The Force Awakens going to drop this Thursday? Some people say maybe. I happen to think it's going to drop on Monday. Don't worry. We'll be covering it in depth. So stay tuned for that. And hashtag Collider Jedi Council to get some questions out there. Follow me at Christian Harloff, Twitter, and Instagram. 
And of course, our lovely host today, the apparently not only child, Ashley Mova. Did you Ashley, think I was an be... only child? Phil. I kind of thought My you did. Goodness. Don't worry, I'm brother too down Phil. To earth for that. Don't worry. Guys, this Phil he'll, person he'll, isn't he'll real. think you're an only child for the next <laughs> 10 years. <laughs> you guys can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. And of course, you can find me by following me on uh, Facebook or on Twitter, just at John Campia. Special thanks to the others in the room Ray, Wendy, Dennis back there. And thank you. Do you remember, guys? What's most important here is not what these idiots at this table have to say what's important is what you have to say make sure you jump in the comment section of this video leave all your thoughts on any or all the topics that we discuss here today that'll do it for us guys thanks so much for joining us and until next time bye bye